They are one of the poorest and most isolated peoples in the world. And one of the most militarized. An army of the poor in a land of astounding natural wealth. An animal herding people in a dying world of drought. The Tuareg are the indigenous people of the Sahara, the world's largest desert. A people divided by colonial history between Mali and Algeria, Libya, Niger, and Burkina Faso. A homeland that straddles the largest energy deposits in Africa. Their dream of an independent state in the Sahara would threaten five countries and the vital interests of a world power. For decades, it was Libyan leader Muammar al-Gaddafi who contained Tuareg ambitions, opening Libya's doors to a mass migration of the tribe and training their sons to be his mercenaries, to fight his losing wars. Now, the man with the power to control them was gone. And the Tuareg have come home. A quarter of a million workers and fighters returning to Niger, the poorest country on earth homeless and penniless, carrying everything they own. They arrive in a homeland many haven't seen in decades, cheering because they've survived. A journey of escape from Libya, in which whatever falls is forever left behind. For the Tuareg, the road out of Libya was a gauntlet of abuse. Viewed as Gaddafi loyalists, they were detained and tortured in the Libyan Sahara, robbed of every penny they owned, thrown out of a land that had been their life. They were the losers of war. Mohamed Igdali was a civilian worker in Libya, forced to flee with his family. الله ومعمر وليبيا وبس علامة هو هو علامة معمر هذا هذا ما نبون Twenty-five-year-old Mohammed Hassan spent his life in Libya, 
he thought of himself as Libyan and signed up for Gaddafi's army. But Mohammed Hassan is not a son of Libya. <laughs> Gaddafi rarely gave African immigrants citizenship, no matter how many of his wars they fought or how long they lived in Libya. Now his mercenaries flooded the streets of Agadez, capital of Niger's desert north, homeless and jobless. <laughs> Thousands of young people like Mohammed Hassan found themselves in a homeland they had not grown up in. Watching a rodeo for cars stolen from Libya, trying to forget the war. for decades, Saharan peoples have looked to North Africa to survive. This is the poorest region in the world. Earnings from Libya support hundreds of thousands of lives. The Tuareg rely on animals and pasture to survive. Totally dependent on rain. But climate change is making their desert drier and more lifeless each year. Gaddafi's Libya opened its borders and job market to them, enabling people to rebuild herds wiped out by decades of drought. <laughs> With his mother and father dead, Mohammed Hassan has only one close relative left. He's setting out for the family's ancestral area to find her. A journey back to a world he last saw at the age of six. He's used to the wealth of Libya, so the culture shock is huge. Mm. 
محمد 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 خسن 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 محمد 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 خسن خسن محمد خسن محمد خسن محمد خسن محمد ولكن <تصفيق> 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 وفي نولو عليكم مضر انتنا يتكزوا ناس بلي او يدوم الشر الله زارة من زارة ما وصل تمخصرت معاونا وينت طبعا انك زارة ورتزد فلسنا كور فريقة قيمة ورشارة ورتقى شير دي المجنة أص إن قياسا ما يدور تلبد أي ولا ترى تصل أو يدمنا كي مرتوزة أرزة تجريدة قدر تتصل. في الليل برد هل. هيك ديم الزمع السحراء ده كل ديم مريض ديم مريض ديم مرض هلب لا عنده مستشفى لا عنده شيء لا قدروا تحليل الله متعودين بس لكن السحراء ده وعر السحراء دي وعر In neighboring Mali, in the summer of 2011, thousands more Tuareg fighters were also returning to their impoverished homeland from Libya. But Mali's Tuaregs had Gaddafi's guns and a plan to create an independent state for which they'd already chosen a flag and an old Tuareg name. <laughs> And from deep in the desert, a man was racing to meet them. The mastermind behind the exodus of fighters and weapons from Libya. A man with the power to unite Tuareg fighters. On his way to launch the biggest uprising the Sahara had seen in a century. Ibrahim Bahanga had no use for his Malian passport, nor did he respect the borders and countries bestowed by the French. To him, the Sahara was Tuareg land, and now they were going to take it back. But from his perch in the desert, he saw something coming. Tuaregs would not be the only ones to emerge from a collapsing Libya with a lot of guns and a plan. Al-Qaeda was also preparing to realize bin Laden's dream of a new Afghanistan in the Sahara. Bahanga never made it to his rebel meeting. Just hours before, he'd be dead. Before he died, veteran rebel leader Ibrahim Bahanga had persuaded Tuaregs in the Libyan army to desert Gaddafi and join him in the struggle for an independent state called Azawad. 
Many hundreds responded to his call, making their way to the remote mountains of Zakak on Mali's northern border with Algeria to prepare for the coming war. The Tuareg rebels would call themselves the National Movement for the Liberation of Azawad, MNLA a group with broad appeal to Tuaregs across five countries with a separatist goal and unprecedented weapons to implement it. Their leader, Ibrahim Bahanga, had now become a threat to regional governments and to the rise of Al-Qaeda in the Sahara. Hours before a crucial rebel unity summit Ibrahim Bahanga died deep in the desert in a suspicious car accident. It was a major blow for the MNLA before even starting the uprising, but their young, untested political leader was determined to continue. <laughs> In Tuareg villages of the Mali and Sahara, young men were joining the MNLA rebels. Shehu had just returned from the nation's capital, fleeing riots against people of the desert north. In Mali, the Tuareg are in the minority, and people in the south were angry that Tuaregs were trying to divide their country. <laughs> In Mali, state power lies with the farming tribes of the sub-Saharan South. The vast northern desert is underdeveloped, remote from services and decision-making. The Tuareg have risen up seven times against Mali and Niger since their independence in 1960. Villages like this provide the foot soldiers. Seven families lost fathers here, killed by the army during a previous Tuareg uprising in the 1990s. Banning, 
سون سین یونو سان سون ورلو هر هر دو روا دو لاندا کا یو کاشین شنا هر تن و سن تن سن تن دی لار می تو زو زرم فلا سن دتا مالیم و انا غا کولاندا تو سینی ان نتوزا تو سی نمپو اسا نتوزا يا مانك دي لاليمنتاسيون يا يا ري قلت لها قلت لها شكشي قلت لها دابا سي دابا موكو قلت وضري تي لا فروان انا تلقت اشي شعر انا طنغا ورهنا هكا نهرت عاد دوسني ابقى من ديدي نسلت قلت سني تي ديفلوبمنت انا قلت سني تي البروجي تاع قلت سني تي دولا قلت لها أنا رأس أفل أفل ننكر التكما أفل بس درسنا لها رتايجا. Shehu and his friends set out to join the MNLA fight for an independent country in northern Mali. But now, from the desert, came other rebels with an entirely different agenda. Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, a powerful clandestine military force in the Sahara. Al-Qaeda, too, had a vision for northern Mali but they had no use for secular nationalism. Al-Qaeda wanted an Islamic emirate based on Sharia law, and they'd found a local Tuareg host, Ansar ad-Din, an Islamic militia founded to compete with the separatist MNLA. Ansar ad-Din were also busy recruiting in the area. <laughs> As the MNLA prepared to unleash a war of independence, Al-Qaeda was positioning itself to capitalize on the chaos. By January 2012, Mali was a powder keg, a country about to explode. This is northern Niger, the heart of the Tuareg homeland. A desperately poor and dangerous place. Used as a transit zone by drug smugglers, where foreigners are routinely kidnapped and sold to Al-Qaeda for ransoming. Northern Niger shares a long border with northern Mali, a border that has no meaning to the Tuareg people of the area. It's a stone's throw from Azawad, their hoped-for state in northern Mali, and it's known to the people as Azawag. Northern Niger's Azawag region is filled with former rebels and soldiers back from Libya, men whose only skill is fighting, who dream of a Tuareg state. Omar is a former Tuareg rebel, living in northern Niger with his family. This area contains one of the most lucrative uranium mines in the world, but very few benefits reach the people. This place has no running water, electricity, schools, hospitals, or work. Omar's last job was fighting as a mercenary for Gaddafi, 
against NATO and the Libyan revolution. As a child, Omar watched his father die of hunger. Now he is the father figure, with 15 people depending on him for survival. His mother, Amamatu, is ill, but the family don't have money to take her to the doctor. Omar returned from the war in Libya empty-handed. Every day, Omar must walk to the well to bring water for the family. A four hour round trip. The grass that sustains their animals grows far away from the well. Access to the most basic element of life is a daily struggle for the people of this region. In the Sahara, people lose their minds looking for water. Like Omar's brother Ahmadou, who only talks in whispers. And his uncle Mohammed, who wanders the desert and often hides inside dried up wells. <laughs> The family's only source of survival is their animals and Omar looks after them alone. His only sane brother is in prison for trying to illegally enter Libya for work. Omar is looking after his brother's family in addition to his own. And after the Libya war, there are now even more mouths to feed. Brothers Abdullah and Hamid sent to the desert to live with cousin Omar after their mother died in the NATO bombing of Tripoli. The boys have been told she's in a Libyan hospital getting better. 
They don't know the truth about their mother, but they suspect. Each day, the children walk an hour over the hills to attend the only kind of school in their land. The verses they learn here will brace them for the harsh life they will face. Teaching patience to accept what they cannot change and know that amidst uncertainty and death, they are connected to something eternal and permanent. But with only this schooling, they will all remain illiterate. In Libya, Hamid had begun learning to read and write. Now, he reads the letters over and over, unable to form them into a word. Now that he's in the Sahara, Hamid's education is over. At night, Omar and his friends do the best they can. They show the boys a few words picked up in travels to Libya or Algeria. But it's hard to remember how they go. Every generation here is illiterate, like most of the people of Niger. <laughs> With no help from the state to drill proper wells, people tunnel into the sand looking for water with their hands. Deep, homemade wells that sometimes collapse, burying them alive inside. <laughs> Hey. 
mitalaku gas so iden dot swari tafak bendiga isi waptu dak mara ort sena kur sirkidi wal ort sirkidi dirwat anta tani tawans fala sani tibrijutanwa anta tani wans mugir on January 17, 2012, a new rebellion started in Mali. Tuareg rebels, the MNLA, launched their fight for Azawad, an independent state they plan to create in northern Mali. But the separatist rebels were not fighting alone. Every step the MNLA took was shadowed by Al-Qaeda and its local ally, Ansar al-Din, who matched them bullet for bullet in the fight against Mali, ready to stake their own claim to any territory. Under assault by Tuareg separatists and the veteran Mujahideen, northern Mali began falling to the rebels, the army surrendering or fleeing south. MNLA fighters in Mali hoped Tuaregs in neighboring Niger would also rebel. Their late leader, Ibrahim Bahanga, had been planting the seeds of a regional Tuareg uprising for years. But his death had deprived the cause of a unifying leader. Then came the worst drought to hit Niger in years, ending any chance of a broad regional rebellion. As Mali descended into war, in northern Niger, former rebel Omar was in no position to join a rebellion. The drought was catastrophic. Hundreds of thousands of animals died. Omar's family lost half their animals, a herd built on the proceeds of 10 years of work in Libya. When the rains finally came, it was too little, too late. With the change of seasons, there is one piece of good news for the family. Omar's brother was finally released from prison. He'd been jailed for trying to illegally enter Libya. <laughs> to celebrate, he brought cookies for the children.
But Abdullah and Hamid don't want Swedes from Libya. They want news of their mother. And there is none. And mad uncle Muhammad has wandered away again. Omar's brother and mother, Amamatu, search for him in the desert. Muhammad. Muhammad. Hey, Muhammad. Muhammad. <laughs> Muhammad, who went mad searching for water for the family, would never be seen again. But with the animals gone and Omar's brother returned, one of the men must leave in search of money. And Omar knows this time it's his turn. Driven by a devastating drought, the nation would move once again. In their thousands, the Tuareg of Niger chose emigration over war. With no passports or papers, 
risking their lives to try and re-enter Libya because they cannot survive at home. Next week on Orphans of the Sahara, Mali suffers total state collapse as a massive Tuareg rebellion sweeps the country. Al-Qaeda takes over Timbuktu, and a coup d'etat topples the last vestige of government. <laughs> 